relatives, we may return to your seat. Thank you. Thank you very much for all blessed participants of the sixth iconist that was the opening of our agenda today. And we've been through all the sequences of events for the official opening. Finally, we have arrived to the most awaited session of this event, the sixth iconist 2000, 2023, with the theme, Religion Still Matters, navigating the relevance of religion across the issue of environment renewable technology, artificial intelligence, and social inclusion. The next agenda is the main keynote speech, which will be delivered by Kiai Haji Ulil Absar Abdullah M.A. from NU Institute for Research and Human Resources Development, PBNU, with title, The Significance of Faith to Preserve Ecological Sustainability in the Era of Technological Advancement. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will be guided by our moderator, Ibu Siti Aisha, SEMPhil, PhD. I am Anafa, and I am Yaya. We'd like to pass this session to our moderator, and to our distinguished moderator, please welcome. The Honorable Rector of Win Sharif Hidayatullah Jakarta, Professor Dr. Asep Saipuddin Johar, MA PhD. Our keynote speaker, Honorable K. Haji Ulil Afsar Abdullah, also the chairman of PBNU. Uh, all distinguished participants uh, of uh, this conference day, it's such a uh, great honor for me uh, to come and see you. Uh, meet all great speakers and enthusiastic uh, participants in at the International Conference of Interreligious Studies, Science and Technology, ICONIS 2023. And the theme raised uh, by committee this uh, time is uh, very interesting actually, because uh, relatable with uh, the problems we are facing today, religion still matter, or maybe I can say in question mark, is religion still matter because uh, from this uh, conversation from this discussion we want to navigate the relevance of religion across the issue of environments renewable energy artificial intelligence and social inclusion first of all i would like to welcome uh, to all um, participants and invited speakers who come from Indonesia and abroad as well, who are investing their time and energy to come and share their insight with us in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, as we already know, the progress of science that has given birth to advanced technology is an inevitability. Uh, whether we like or dislike it, technology has become part of our life and we have to deal with it. Even though it has changed the order of life and even the construction of mankind's uh, worldview toward nature. We have seen the phenomena in the last two years, how the Russia-Ukraine war and also what is currently happening in Middle East area between Israel and Hamas and Alice, how sophisticated technology Military weapons with increasingly destructive quality can devastate a region in just a few seconds. Technology can be very useful for mankind, but on the other hand, technology also promises disaster, disaster to this uh, earth. In the right hands, technology can be useful to build great civilization, but in the wrong hands, technology creates catastrophe in the earth. 
There is one approach that human use when approaching and treating nature that is uh, inspired by religion teachings, namely anthropocentrism. This view assumes that humans are created better, nobler, uh, with higher level than other creatures. So that the um, consequence of this uh, view, humans think they have more power uh, other, uh, than other creatures. This privilege should make humans a caliph who is responsible for taking care of what God has created. But the contrary, the privilege makes humans become arrogant and they see nature is merely considered as an object to provide human needs. This way of thinking is what differentiates the behavior of modern humans and ancient humans when dealing with their environments. In pre-modern times, uh, people in their, in their system of belief, they believe something sacred because they believe in something that's sacred. So they perform rituals, some rituals uh, to respect, to give respect to the sacred one. For example, in my uh, culture, in Buginis, uh, there is a manuscript uh, very lo longer than Mahabharata and Ramayana, I think. Uh, it, it's written that there is a ritual machera. Machera, it's a, they sacrifice some uh, animals, certain animals, and in certain numbers. And this blood of the animals they put on the tree before they cut uh, the tree down. So it's not only sacrificing animals, but this is the way or language of uh, ancient people uh, to respect the sacred one. And this modern era, this is the big loss of us. For example, every morning or every day, we are engaged with our um, uh, gadget every time. But people in the ancient times, they communicate, they build the communication with the nature. Ah, today will be rain. Or, ah, today the wind will be going to the west or to the uh, to the to the east, but people in the, in this modern era, we don't have we don't have this kind of communication anymore. We don't get connected with our nature anymore. So this is big loss to modern people. This should be a big concern of religious people, religious community, because in every religion provides a guided tool for its followers, and. If this religion is a set of values and norms. Okay? And religion normally contains two aspects, esoteric and exoteric. Exoteric talk about norms, but esoteric aspect talk about value. And how we can find uh, the sacred again in this uh, modern era, faith playing uh, the, the, the important role uh, to to help us, to get us finding again the secret in our consciousness. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is just maybe quite a little bridging from me. I want to welcome our keynote speaker, Bapak Ki Haji Sar Abdullah, to share his insight uh, with us. Bapak Uhilab Sar Abdullah, the time is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Asep Sefuddin, Rector of UIN Jakarta and also the organizers of the sixth conference of ICONIS for inviting me to this conference that uh, 
gathers. Okay, oh, okay. I should uh, stand in the podium. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, I'm so honored to be invited into this conference that uh, gathers scholars and experts of various and diverse academic background to discuss, converse, and exchange ideas, thought, and insight that matters to the issues that we are going to discuss uh, in this conference. As you all know that the most important foundation of academic life is research and the pursuit of truth. However, this intellectual pursuit of truth cannot in any way be undertaken in an isolated world. The pursuit of truth undertaken by scholars should be carried out in an interconnected world whereby scholars are in perpetual conversation with other fellow scholars. A pursuit of truth in academia <coughs> is a result of a collective endeavor. A scholar may undertake a research in a solitary chamber surrounded by a stack full of books, but he or she is in fact not alone. He or she is in constant dialogue with other fellow scholars from across the world. Dialogue, conversation, and exchange are the foundation of academic life. This conference is just doing that, a dialogue and conversation. A dialogue and, con and conference, however, can only proceed on one condition, and that is to have more than just one viewpoint. A dialogue that allows only a single viewpoint to be an overriding and predominant perspective on matters discussed is not worthy to be named a dialogue. It is rather an authoritarian monologue. It is said that it is said that one way or another this authoritarianism of monologue has been under various and sometimes noble guises creeping into our academic life under some pretext of protecting stability or the so-called orthodoxy, both sacred and secular, for instance, there are attempts at muzzling and silencing alternative voices, especially those voices that put the prevailing orthodoxy at jeopardy. We should acknowledge with full honesty that our academic life often fall prey to this lure of authoritarianism of monologue without us even realizing it. What is no less dangerous, what is no less dangerous than this monologue of orthodoxy is another type of monologue resulting from, let us, academic parochialism, by which I mean a tendency among scholars to be immersive in life of mind while not bothering a bit about what is going on in the real life of people. I know that what Hannah Arendt called Vita Contemplativa or the life of mind can bring to us scholars and intellectuals a lot of satisfaction and gratification. I also know very well that there is always a strong pull among scholars toward squeezing reality, both social and mental, into a neat construct of theoretical formula and treating this abstracted form of reality to be something that takes life on its own. This parochial attitude among certain academia, sooner or later, will generate a skepticism and cynicism among people toward the role of science in society. In fact, we already encountered the cynical attitude in society toward scholars and scholarly life. 
And this cynicism is made even worse in the post-truth era. We as scholars then bear a moral burden to restore the academic life into its proper pedestal as a site where different voices and viewpoints can be put into test and challenge without fear of being trampled by an existing orthodoxy. Monologue is the enemy of free academic life or of any society in general. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say a few words about the general theme of this conference. Religion still matters. Let us unpack a bit some underlying assumption lurking behind this manifesto sounding uh, topic. First of all, this general thing, as we know well, certainly refers to the general prevailing theory of secularization. In his classic, the sacred canopy, Professor Peter Berger came up with the succinct definition of secularization as the processes by which sectors of society and culture are removed from the domination of religious institution and symbol. The removal of public life from the domination of religious symbol and institution certainly entails a life where religion does not matter anymore. This is the gist of secularization theory in general. For quite some time, this is a theory that predominates the academic landscape in Europe and elsewhere in 60s and 70s, shaping an angle through which, through which modern scholars see and interpret modern social realities. In my view, secularization theory is a conceptual construct that is reflective of certain era and society. Hence, its limited explanatory power to understand social reality. It is certainly valid for certain era and social context, namely the European context. In 1999, Professor Berger himself produced another groundbreaking volume, The Secularization of the, the Desecularization of the World, in which he showed the, the irrelevance of secularization theory as a conceptual lens to understand and interpret the contemporary realities, including those realities in Europe and North America where this theory derived its initial impetus. Religious institution and symbol might lose, might lose its grip in certain era and social context, but contemporary social dynamic shows that unmistakable return of, religious, of religion in people lives both within and outside the borders of European context. Indonesia, for example, for instance, never saw a receding role of religion in society. Religious symbol and institution were and continue to be robust in Indonesian society. In other words, religion always matters to Indonesian society of any religious and faith background. Some Indonesian scholars that, for some Indonesian scholars, the question is not whether or not religion remain relevant and matters. It is not that question. But because religion always matter to our life. The question rather is how and to what extent religion assert its influence. Some scholars, I mean Indonesian scholars, complain about the excess of social and cultural role exercised by religion and religious institution in contemporary 
Indonesian life as the specter of pre presidential election loom large in Indonesia these days there is a widespread fear that religion might be used in the wrong way to mobilize an electoral vote in a manner that endanger the social fabric of Indonesian society in what is commonly called identity politics. Yes, there might be some sign of secularizing moment in modern Indonesian social landscape, salient among which was the marginalization of religion during the New Order era, but it never sidelined religion totally from the public life of Indonesian people. Post-reformacy era that began in 1998 even saw an effort, an effort increasing role of religion in our society. The question is not whether religion matters or not, but how it makes itself matter to society. This is the challenge of Indonesian scholars today. How to make religion matter in a productive and constructive way. I want to share with you here the intellectual dynamic that is underway in Nahdlatul Ulama, which I represent here. Since 90s, Nahdlatul Ulama embarked on an intellectual project to what we call recontextualization of Islamic tradition. By this we mean an intellectual endeavor based on Islamic classical tradition to reinterpret and rethink Islamic intellectual legacy or Turaf in the light of new social realities. One of the biggest problem of Muslim today lies exactly here, namely in our willingness and ability to undertake what is called the Adatul Qira'ah or rereading, rethinking Islamic Turaf in, in a way that can respond productively to modern realities. We all know well that Islamic tradition is a product of certain social reality and context. This context is long gone. But the challenge is that this textual legacy produced by the bygone era still sit with us and influence the way Muslim of today conduct their life. This textual legacy constitutes what is normative for Muslim people. Unless this legacy is unpacked and rethought, there is always a big problem of a gap between the text and the context. The challenge of for Muslim scholars today is how to fill this gap with a new understanding. Scholars with this within Nahdlatul Ulama has embarked on this project on formulating a new istimbat or understanding of Islamic tradition. We launch what we call a project of halakha fikih peradaban or the halakha or seminars, a discussion that aim at re-understanding and reinterpreting Islamic tradition with the vision of filling this gap between our textual Turaf with the new reality. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much uh, to Bapak K. Haji uh, Ulil Absar Abdullah for very uh, great speech today. And for the next uh, agenda, we are going to the plenary one, right? There, okay. okay, so let's big, uh, give big applause to our keynote speaker, Bapak K. Haji Ulil Absar Abdullah.
Ladies and gentlemen, for plenary uh, session one, I would like to invite the three of our speakers, uh, Professor Robert Wehevner from Boston University. The second one, Professor Minako Sakai from University of New South Wales. And the third one, Professor Dr. Abbas Panakal from University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom. So all uh, speakers, uh, please welcome to the stage. Professor Robert W. Hefner. Professor Hefner is Professor of Anthropology and International Relations at Boston University. He is Director of Center for the Study of Asia and former Director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs, CURA, at Boston University. Professor Hefner has directed 19 research projects and organized 18 international conferences. He is a globally recognized expert on Islam with numerous books on Islam, religion, democracy, and international affairs. Associate Professor Minako Sakai, PhD. Associate Professor Minako Sakai, PhD, is Deputy Head of School Research at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, the University of New South Wales, UNSW, Canberra. She is a dedicated scholar with extensive publication in the field of Islam, anthropology, gender, and social policies. Most recently with Professor Amalia Fauzia, she wrote book title, Women Entrepreneurs and Business Empowerment in Muslim Country, which published by Palgrave Macmillan. She also awarded Indonesian National Cultural Award by Indonesian Ambassador for Australia and Vanuatu for contribution in Indonesian studies and the Indonesian language in Australia. Dr. Abbas Panakal. Dr. Abbas Panakal is the director of International Interfaith Harmony Initiative, which has been organizing the International Interfaith conferences in collaboration with United Nations Initiative, the Malaysia Prime Minister's Department for Unity and Integration, and the International Islamic University Malaysia for the past six years. Abbas was awarded a fellowship by the Center for Interfaith and Culture Dialogue from Griffith University, Australia. Panaka is also the editor of a book series on integrated and indigenized Islam of South and Southeast Asia. He was also the project coordinator of the G20 Interfaith Summit in Australia, 2014, Turkey, 2015, Germany, 2017, and was actively involved in the organization and coordination of several interfaith summits and relayed conferences in the Middle East and South Asia. For this plenary session one, we are going to talk about the impact of disruptive technology upon religion, democracy, peace building, and economy. Uh, because uh, our speakers cannot uh, see the uh, monitor, so they, that's why they decide to come back to their chair because of uh, a technical problem. Is it okay? <laughs> I'm alone here <laughs> in the stage. <laughs> okay. Um, according to this topic, yeah, um, I want to mention a professor from Iran, Iranian professor of physics. Uh, he explained how science, which is considered rational and has special methods, they are thought to be unrelated to religious or metaphysical views, actually developed from metaphysical presuppositions. As uh, we all know that uh, science and uh, metaphysics something different, but for him, uh, actually, uh, science can develop from metaphysical presuppositions. For example, Einstein's general theory of relativity is supported by Aristotle's theory of causality, 
which emphasizes the existence of causa prima as the beginning of the creation of life. Einstein delayed announcing his theory for two years until he was convinced that his theory was in accordance with the principle of causality, which he believed was a universal principle. And according to Golshani, one of the factors in the change in the approach taken by humans, especially scientists, to nature is because nature is seen solely a machine which has no rights or gives rise to an exploitative attitude towards nature. Before the development of modern science, most scientists believed in objective moral laws. Advances in science have had the effect of marginalizing ethical consideration and spreading the subjectivism of moral values. Sponsored by the view of capitalism, which wants to accumulate as much capital as possible, nature in front of capitalism is just a capital mine, which is very tempting to be drained as much as possible. Uh, unfortunately, as humanity's knowledge increases in explaining the mysteries of nature and giving birth to technological products, modern human discoveries have become a disaster for humans themselves. Technology that aims to provide convenience for humans actually doesn't bring prosperity to humanity because excessive exploitation of natural resources causes changes in the balance of the natural movement of the cosmos. Okay, for the first speech, you are going to hear from Professor Robert We Hefner, PhD, who are joined from uh, online from Zoom. Is it ready? Okay, to Professor Robert Wehefner, uh, your the time is yours, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very clear. Well, th let me thank you, Bu Amelia and Pa Andy. Let me thank you for this kind invitation to uh, an event that I very much appreciate. I'm sorry that, as you know, uh, my flight to Indonesia, which I set out on Friday morning, uh, experienced uh, technical difficulties, and as a result, uh, I can't be with you in person. But uh, I'll give my paper nonetheless, and again, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, the title of my talk tonight is called Why Indonesia Matters, Lessons on Making Democracy, Social Media, and Religiosity Work for the Common Good. Um, can, again, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I begin. In recent years, the political spirit of our times has taken a downward turn. In striking contrast to the ambulant optimism of some years ago, the post-Cold War 1990s in particular, it's become a commonplace of political commentary today to speak of a decline in the quality of democracy in the West, uh, including my own United States, and a regression in democratization's momentum in areas of the global South, uh, as it's called, including Southeast Asia and, of course, the Muslim. Middle East. In the eyes of the respected political observer Larry Diamond, uh, democracies, democracy is said to have fallen on hard times. Now from an Indonesian perspective and from the perspective of those of us who love Indonesia, saya adalah orang pecinta Indonesia juga, but from an Indonesian perspective this new wave of pessimism with regard to democracy and citizenship deserves special attention because it inevitably raises questions as to where democracy and citizen belonging in Indonesia are going. The question is of additional concern because the ASEAN neighborhood in which Indonesia finds itself is one of the world areas regarded 30 years ago as at the cutting edge of democratization, but today it's regarded as in the throes of democratic decline. In particular, with the collapse of democracy in Thailand and the Duterte government's abuses of human rights in the Philippines, few political observers today regard ASEAN as a region where democracy is ascendant. A few Indonesianists in Western countries have suggested Indonesia is perhaps going in a similar 
downward direction towards democratic de de regression. But I disagree. And it's the reasons for this disagreement that I want to emphasize today. Before doing so, however, let me make a few more remarks on the time and space that Indonesia habits, inhabits so that we can put Indonesia's democracy in a comparative perspective. We know that the neighborhood in which Indonesia finds itself includes not just the ASEAN number, neighbors, but the 57 members of the Organization of, the, of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC. 48 of the OIC member countries are Muslim majority. In these latter countries, assessments of Muslim success at implementing democracy have also in recent years taken a decidedly somber or even pessimistic turn. This reflects the fact that by, 19, by 2013, the hopeful dreams of the 2011 era of Democratic Spring had given way to the grim realization that in all of the Arab Muslim nations today now, even including Tunisia, progress toward pluralist democracy had either stalled or it had stopped entirely. Now, Indonesian, Indonesia, I want to suggest, it's obviously not an Arab country, but it's an often, it's an often overlooked exception to these downward trends in the Muslim majority world. Certainly, as the sociologist, the Indonesian sociologist Vedi Hadis observed several years ago, the Indonesia that ex exited from 32 years of authoritarian rule in 1998-99 demonstrates that neither liberal democracy nor theocratic authoritarianism, and now I quote Vedi, constitutes the inevitable terminus of modern Islamic politics. Modern Islamic politics goes in multiple directions. Some Western analysts have reached even far more pessimistic conclusions than has Wed Baby, since suggesting that Indonesia is also on the slippery slope of democratic decline. However, and again, here's my core thesis this evening. I disagree with this new pessimism with regard to Indonesia and Indonesian democracy. Indeed, my argument tonight is, or this morning is that Indonesia has done remarkably well in transitioning to and consolidating democracy and an inclusive practice of citizenship. A major reason that Indonesia has shown success in this twin process has to do with two things. First, the country's progress, remarkable progress over the past 75 years at developing a shared national culture of citizen belonging, a sense of kabangsaha. And second, the remarkable role played for several decades by those two pillars of democracy and citizenship in this country, the Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. Democracy in Indonesia, this successful achievement in demo of democracy in Indonesia, would not have been possible without these two Muslim mass organizations. Now that's the essence of my, argu my argument here this morning. And that's one that I would like to try to expand by providing an overview of just how it is that Indonesia has achieved the remarkable democratic success that it has. So I begin now, again, the substance of my argument. At the heart of my argument are several broad theoretical observations. First, and this is a truism I think recognized by democratic theorists everywhere. First, whether in Indonesia, in the United States, or any other democracy, the formal institutions of elections, free assembly, and representative government are never sufficient to make democracy work in a way that guarantees equal rights and dignity for all. Democratic institutions remain vulnerable to uncivil and undemocratic abuse unless reinforced by a broadly shared culture of citizen equality, one similar in spirit to what my colleague at Universitas Gajamada Zainal Abedin Bagir has described as a pluralisme kawargaan. A pluralisme kawargaan, or pluralist citizenship, is a culture of citizen, citizenship that not merely tolerates differences across religious and ethnic divides, but actively upholds and defends the equality, civic rights, and freedom of all citizens. Whether in Indonesia, the United States, or any other democratic country, Democracy without this inclusive citizen culture remains vulnerable to populist showmanship 
and undemocratic abuse. Recent developments in my own country, not least with regard to former President Donald Trump, show this, I think, in a particularly painful manner. As developments in Western democracies over the past generations make clear that formal elections, formal elections and other democratic institutions do not automatically produce the shared democratic culture that I'm referring to here as a pluralism or kawarga. In fact, since the 1970s, 1990s, Western democracies, including my own United States, have witnessed social trends antithetical to a pluralism and a civic pluralist equality. One particularly striking example of these anti-pluralist trends that I've mentioned already has been the rise of authoritarian populism in Western democracies. Populists in the West attempt to polarize and divide the, pop, the broader public by loudly denouncing political elites, foreign, especially Muslim immigrants, and globalization. Populists like these erode the sense of equality and decency across difference on which democratic citizenship depends and replace it with the binary of us versus them. Having divided the citizenry in this way, the populist leader then claims to speak for the virtuous masses and in so doing undermine citizen equality and genuine democratic participation. I've already said that unfortunately Donald Trump is a powerful example of the latter in my country. So now on back to Indonesia. How was it that a nation as diverse as Indonesia with some 700 ethnic groups and diverse religious communities, how is it that this country has been able to resist exclusivist trends like those and develop a significant measure of citizen inclusivity or civic pluralist equality. My takeaway from having worked in Indonesia and been a lover of Indonesia for some 40 years is that the, this achievement, this achievement of civic pluralist inclusivity was made possible by several developments in civil society in general and Muslim civil society in particular. The most important of these developments gained momentum in the 1990s and involved the normative work, the normative cultural work to convince Muslim Indonesians, Indonesians that democracy and Pancasila pluralism are compatible with Islam. What is so remarkable about Indonesia, this democratic culture making, remember my point is, is that democ formal democracy alone is not sufficient you need a culture of democracy for democracy to work and be genuinely inclusive. And what is so remarkable about Indonesia is that this democratic culture making was performed not by secular elites, but by Muslim public intellectuals with ties to Muslim mass organizations. These individuals worked tirelessly to convince their respective organizations and the broader Indonesian public that democracy in Pancasila Sila's citizenship are not just compatible with, but vital realization of Islamic values. Now the Muslim, jumping ahead just a couple of sentences, the Muslim leadership of this movement, this democratic movement, displayed a feature democratic theorists in the West, like O'Donnell and Schmitter, identified years earlier as vital for a successful transition, transition from authoritarian rule and a consolidation of democracy. That's what Indonesia had. What I'm referring to is that Indonesia had a coalitional structure that linked exemplary individuals, polit politicians, intellectuals, and others actively promoting democracy and citizenship through mass organizations in society through which those values, those democratic values, could be socialized among the public as a whole. And that's what the Indonesian Muslim leadership did. To state the matter differently, the key to Indonesia's democracy-making achievement lay in the fact that beginning in the 1980s, a new generation of Muslim public intellectuals, again, with ties to Muslim, Muslim mass organizations, Muslim intellectuals like Nukholish Majid, Daumar Harjo, and of course, Abdurrahman Wahid, these individuals, in conjunction with the central leadership of Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah, produced that core scholarship on which democracy depends, a core scholarship disseminated Islamic rationales 
for Indonesian democracy, for pluralist citizenship, and consolidated that, those values in the Muslim public as a whole. In other words, well before the great political transition of the Reformasi era, Muslim leaders in MNU and Muhammadiyah had established, had succeeded in establishing a broad public consensus on democratic governance as a maslaha, public good. There's the distinction, the remarkable achievement of Indonesia. Without this consensus on Islam and democracy, Indonesia's return to democracy after 1998-99 would not have been possible. It was these Muslim leaders and Muslim civil society organizations that made Indonesian, Indonesia's return to, to democracy possible. As it struggled then to, and toward and then returned to democracy in 1998-99, Indonesia also possessed a second comparative cultural and ethical advantage when it comes to the task of making an inclusive, making the inclusive democratic culture on which formal democracy depends. The second comparative advantage had to do with remarkable developments in Islamic higher education. These are often overlooked by more conventional political observers, but commentators on Muslim culture around the world have long recognized the pivotal importance of public schooling and higher Islamic education in efforts to create and disseminate a culture and practice of inclusive citizenship in Muslim-majority societies. Without that effort in Muslim higher education, democracy again is weak and finds difficulty being consolidated. As we all know, this challenge of consolidating a democratic culture is complicated in Muslim-majority societies as a result of certain Islam or Muslim society-specific path dependencies. The most challenging, challenging of these have to do with certain discriminatory or differentiating legacies in classical Islamic jurisprudence, or fiqh, and I'm referring to certain differentiating tendencies with regard to dhimis or protected minorities, non-Muslims, and of course, women. If left in place, if these jurisprudential or fiqh legacies are not addressed, and if allowed to determine a Muslim public's ethical priorities, these jurisprudential legacies may, may make an equal and inclusive practice of citizenship impossible. And it's here again, however, that Indonesia stands out in the brilliance of its Muslim leadership and its political and educational leaders. In Indonesia from the late 1980s on, Muslim scholars associated with the State Islamic University as well as the Nakhatu Ulama and Muhammadiyah University system, crafted educational programs to revise, to address and revise these fiqh legacies, discriminatory or differentiating legacies, and to provide Islamic rationales in support of democracy, constitutionalism, and a Pancasila variety of citizen equality. In recent years, indeed, in just over the last seven years, and under the leadership of Kiai Haji Yahya Kholil Stakov, the effort to reform Islamic fiqh on matters related to non-Muslims and citizenship equality has gone even further. Under the leadership of the Gerakan Pumuda Ansor, Bait Ar-Rahma, and the Humanitarian Islam Initiative, ANU officials have sought to preserve fiqh, yes, maintain fiqh, as the queen of the Islamic sciences, an important part of Islamic ethical culture, but they have done so while simultaneously reconstructing Fek's message with regard to non-Muslim and citizen belonging in light of the modern values, the modern Indonesian values of democracy and citizen equality. The Marif Institute and the Muhammadiyah leadership have engaged in the same work of ethical legal renewal from a Muhammadiyah perspective, but with the same a end of supporting democracy and promoting equality, citizen equality across religious divides. There has been and is still today a third and no less striking dimension to Indonesia's comparative democratic advantage. In other words, the reason that it, among Muslim majority societies, has proved so successful at making democracy work. 
And the comparative, the third comparative advantage about which I'm talking has to do with Muslim women and Muslim women's associations. Here, too, efforts to craft a new fiqh, a new public ethical consensus consonant with citizen and gender equality have been given, have been given additional so social impetus by the fact that Indonesia has the largest and the most forward-looking Muslim mass organizations in the world, another remarkable quality of Indonesia. As early as the first decades of the 20th century, Indonesia was among the first Muslim-majority countries to implement far-reaching programs for women's education in Islamic schools. By the 1990s, jumping ahead, obviously, in abbreviating the story, women, Muslim women, were well represented, not just in the general college and university system, but most remarkably, in Indonesia's extraordinary state Islamic university system, the UIN EIEN system. This educational achievement has had significant downstream effects for women's roles in Indonesia. At just under 50% of the mature female population, rates of female labor force participation in Indonesia are three times what they are in Egypt, Jordan, and much of the Arab Middle East, three times greater. These changes in the social circumstances of Muslim Indonesian women have reinforced pressures for a reformulation of fiqh and Islamic ethics consonant with the new women-inclusive realities of Indonesian society today. Now, together, these achievements that I've described in the fields of Muslim education, civil society organizations, particularly Nakat Ulama and Muhammadiyah, and religious scholarship have made possible the culture-making democratic reforms of the Reformasi trans transition. In other words, they've facilitated the democratic culture without which formal democracy remains, risks remaining an empty shell. In its first two years, the Reformasi government expanded press freedoms, legalized independent political parties, and authorized a referendum on East Timor. We all know this. The, the National Assembly passed laws that, which allowed for a far-reaching decentralization. The list goes on. But the basic point I, I wish to make here is that there were a variety of initiatives that, if you will, created once again the democratic culture through which the formal democracy to which Indonesia had made uh, a transition after 1998-99 gained deep cultural uh, uh, substance. I jump ahead now, again on page 8 for those of you who are reading. A no less decisive illustration of the relative strength of democratic values in governing circles in Indonesia in the early years of the transition had to do with mainline Muslim leadership response to implement a state-managed and codified variety of Sharia in national life. Now, Sharia is a legitimate and important part of any and all Muslim societies. But here again, the way in which Muslim Indonesians responded to calls for an implementation of Sharia and, and Islamic values stands out as exceptional. In many Muslim-majority countries, the Sahwa, or Islamic awakening, that has taken place to the, since the 1970s gave rise to growing numbers of Muslim believers uh, calling for a legislatively codified and ultimately highly simplified and, uh, un, uh, and eroded understanding of Islamic law. Critics of such efforts, including the late Abdurrahman Wahid here in Indonesia or Tariq Ramadan in the UK, or Mohammed Hashim Kamali in Malaysia, critics of such codification efforts point out that what was called Sharia by the proponents of this state-enforced legislation, in fact, wasn't really quite Sharia, but it represented a kind of formalistic departure from the Sharia as historically and substantively understood in practice in Muslim scholars. The eminent scholar of Islamic law, whom some of you perhaps know, that is, Sami Zubaydah, rightly describes this variety of Sharia crafting, the codification and legislative formulation that was so pervasive in many Muslim societies, but not Indonesia. He's described it as a triumph of Western models rather than an authentically Islamic Sharia as such. Nonetheless, in many Muslim-majority countries, 
the aspirations for such a codified but ultimately rather misleading or highly simplified understanding of Islamic Sharia gained momentum with the aspiration for democratic government. But again, on this key point, democratic Indonesia in the early Reformasi period was once again different and exceptional in the most remarkable way. Between 2000 and 2002, the National Assembly turned back proposals to change the constitution so as to require the state to implement this simplified and legislatively defined variety of Islamic law for all citizens. The National Assembly did not reject these proposals for Sharia legislation because its members were secularist liberals committed to an American-style separation of religion and state or committed to values other than those of the Sharia. On the contrary, the first of the Ketuhanan principles of the Panchasila, a principle to which Muslim leaders are themselves dedicated, that Ketuhanan and principle makes clear that Indonesia rejects what the political science his Ahmad Kuru has called assertive and assertive secularist separation of religion and state. Panchasila democracy enjoins state and society alike to work together to actively promote religion and Islamic values as maslaha public goods. Although to many Western secularists, many of my colleagues here in the West, today regard such collaborations on religious affairs as somewhat Ill illiberal, I would point out that Indonesia's emphasis on a collaboration for the promotion of religious values is in fact consistent with an earlier 19th century variety of democracy in Western Europe and, and indeed even the United States. There was in these countries too a collaboration similar to that which we see here in Indonesia today in which organizations like the Nahlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah along with Muslim public intellectuals work with the government to promote religious values, Islamic and religious values generally, but they do so in a way that seeks to bring those Islamic values into public life in a way that works with rather than against democracy and Panchasila, pluralism. So I jump ahead to the section, the populist turn. In all four of the respects that I have highlighted today, Muslim society and Indonesian democracy offer important lessons, positive lessons, not just for Muslims, but for Western publics struggling to come to terms with their own citizen plurality and often quite confused, I would say, as to the proper place of religion in public life. Indonesia, I think, has a better understanding of how to make democracy work with religious values. Whether with Donald Trump's hard right populism in the West or Hindu Hindu nationalism in Indonesia, democracy in the 21st century everywhere finds itself confronting a majoritarian populism that seeks to put in place culture making processes antithetical to an inclusive and equal citizenship. By majoritarian populism, I mean a variety of undemocratic authoritarian culture that claims to speak in the name of the majority so as to deny the citizen rights of minorities and others. Although it often emerges from the very heart of electoral competition, majoritarian populism imperils the very citizen values and indeed the religious values on which a true democracy like that here in Indonesia depends. Although I could say more about the challenge to democracy posed by figures like Donald Trump in my own United States, I want to, in the final portion of my remarks this morning to focus on the prospects for populist majoritarianism in Indonesia. In other words, threats to Indonesian democracy. A number of developments have spurred uh, the development of, if you will, populist majoritarian tendencies. But these have... As, as, tendency seen most vigorously with the rise of groups like the Front Pembele Islam and other vigilante groups that have sought, if you will, to turn back the democratic process in Indonesia and equally importantly, turn back the democratic values which Muslim majority organizations like Muhammadiyah and Nadatul Ulama have so effectively, have so br brilliantly promoted. 
these anti-democratic uh, occurrence were also influenced by the emergence of a wide variety, small but wide variety of transnational Islamic Islamist movements in Indonesia that also challenged the tradition of Indonesian democracy and Panchasila pluralism. The emergence of such transnational Islamism represented an unintended byproduct of the new communications technologies and the social media transformation, the transformation that took place in the late 1990s and early 2000s all across the world, but with particular dramatic effect in Indonesia. Both developments allowed Islamist political entrepreneurs who opposed Indonesian democracy and Panchasila ideals and who opposed Madhat ulama and Muhammadiyah's commitment to democracy, it allowed these groups to mobilize uh, uh, against democratic elections and against the democratic values of the Muslim uh, mainstream. Uh, but through a combination of media savvy and polarizing appeal, these new traditional movements sought to reject Indonesia's inclusive variety of democracy and Panchasila pluralism. However, they failed in their efforts. Nazat Ulama and Mohammedia, along with the Ministry of Religion and Education, and most remarkably, no doubt, the state Islamic university system and the Mohammedia Nazat Ulama higher education system, all of these agencies came to together to defend the best of Indonesia's Islam's inclusive democratic achievements. These organizations and the, uh, and the Ministry of Religion and Education program with regard to things like humanitarian Islam and Islam Burkamajiwan demonstrate the centrality of Enu and Muhammadiyah to making democracy work in a Panchasila and inclusive way. Again, I emphasize what I said before. The democratic consolidation in Indonesia would not have been possible without the culture-making efforts of Nafat Ulama, Muhammadiyah, and their respective allies in Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Religion. Now this brings me to my last observation this morning. It's a theoretical and comparative one. It is that notwithstanding the claims of Western secularization theorists a generation ago, Indonesia shows that a high wall of separation between religion and state, a secularist separation, is not necessary, not necessary to make democracy work in an inclusive and equal way. I would point out, just by way of comparison, that such a high wall of separation, though it may be the norm in many Western countries today, it was not the norm for most of the 19th and early 20th century. In fact, most Western European countries still today have established churches and or financial arrangements for the support of religion, much like those that we see in a more active and dynamic way in Indonesia. Speaking more generally, in a 2006 study on the separation of religion and state in 152 countries, the political scientist Jonathan Fox showed that a full separation of uh, religion and st state is found nowhere in the world, in fact, other than in the United States. This is to say that in pursuing a collaborative relationship between religious authorities and the state, Indonesia is not somehow violating some tenet of democracy and citizen equality, because democracy does not require. Indonesia shows, shows brilliantly, that democracy does not require a separation of religion and state. In fact, it benefits from a collaboration between Sorry, religious actors and organizations and a democratic leadership. I'm sorry, Prof. Hebner. Uh, Whether in Indonesia or in other Muslim-majority Muslim lands, however, the aspiration to realize religious values in public life brings certain questions to the fore. Foremost among these questions is the question of which values are most relevant for a shared national life and who has the authority to decide what those values are. But it's precisely here that the achievement of Indonesian democracy, Panchasila citizenship, and the initiatives, the Nafdat Ulama Mohammedian other or Muslim mass organizations in Indonesia. It's here that these achievements shine sorry, so brightly. Prof. Hepner, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry for in yes. uh, interrupting. Uh, I think uh, we have to jump to conclusion. 
the time okay. is up. Okay. Um, that can I just went for summarize my four point? I'm sorry if I didn't. I I thought I was. <laughs> I, yes, I thought I was getting 40 minutes, but just for uh, some points. Have, okay, please. We have so three speakers uh, for this session. Well, that's, well, right. no, that's the 50. Please, please. So please, uh, please. my last, just one sentence. The core lesson, the core lesson of my remarks today, and the core lesson, lesson that I think Indonesia and Indonesian democracy offers is, is that religion still matters. And it matters all the remarkably here in Indonesia because of religion in general and Muslim social organizations, not that the ulama and the Mohammedia uh, matter in particular because they have been key to the success of Indonesia's democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pro Hefner. Thanks for such a honest compliment of uh, Indonesian democracy journey. Hopefully Indonesia always get through uh, the obstacles coming. As uh, Bapak Ulil mentioned before, uh, in Indonesia, religion always matters. And also, Prof. Hefner also uh, emphasized this. Uh, in Indonesia, religion is always matter. And religious organizations uh, such as PBNU and Muhammadiyah have been played important role to build uh, peace in uh, inclusive religious understanding in grassroots. Thank you very much, Prof. Hefner. And for the second opportunity, I would like to give to Professor Monaco Sakai from University of New, Su New South Wales. Please, Prof. Sakai. Selamat pagi dan good morning. Assalamualaikum. I'm Salam Sujatra. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. And um, um, Bob, I really enjoyed your paper. And um, I really wish to see you because we've been communicating over 25 years. But I have never met him in person. But I really feel his work has really been, um, shaped my thought. And I can really uh, continue what he was uh, mentioning, particularly about women. And uh, I'd like to really uh, would like to say Thank you to Professor Asa and Amelia Fauzia, particularly, I think, uh, with Professor uh, Amelia Fauzia. We've been really uh, collaborating, and um, I think the fact that um, I'm on the editorial board, that so, uh, together with also Bob Hefner, on Study Islamia, that um, I'm not a Muslim, I'm a woman, and in fact, um, the university and the editorial board really would like to have input that really explains the way inclusiveness is represented. So I'd like to say thank you very much for having me here today. And also, um, I think the next piece is, is, is uh, his Maju, right here. Yeah. Right here, Maju. Um, I have been working on um, a lot of Indonesia um, social issues, but my really um, thoughts have been on how local um, cultural and religious values can be um, reflected, particularly in thinking about modernity and thinking about development um, policies. And um, I'm very um, fortunate to have a lot of collaborators, particularly from Indonesia. So, um, Pat Bob also endorsed my book on Kacanti Datu Pak Kulitnya, Identitas Kumai, Islam, Murantau, di Sumatera Selatan. And um, after that, I also um, have been working on particularly the impact of um, Islamic microfinancing, or maybe if I continue um, Prof. Uh, Ulil's this morning's talk, religion matters, and that's for sure. But how then religion is um, relevant? So in that context, um, I think
thing uh, what I really wanted to say is religion really is reflected in everyday transactions uh, like Islamic microfinancing or how the religion sees um, sort of lentenir uh, or you know um, uh, loan sort of uh, uh, high interest charging um, um, lenders. And so what I have been doing is to unpack particularly the meaning of religion, and then how social justice, if I continue about Bob's talk, democracy, particularly inclusiveness, and democracy is reflected in uh, everyday transactions. So I have published Muslima Kuwira Sahan dan Pemberdaya Masyarakat, along with uh, Don Pet Duafa, uh, I have been uh, collaborating with them. And also my thinking also goes into community resilience, particularly uh, like Bunjana, or a disaster relief. And I have also profile on how religion, you know, religious organizations really use their thoughts and uh, put it into action. So that was Bill Hall, you know, um, that way. So I have been really investigating and writing about how Islam, you know, is really reflected in, in everyday matter, social transformation of Indonesia. So as Bob said, um, Indonesia's, I agree, Indonesia is really ama amazing, and the fact that um, you know this really huge uh, sort of um, country with so many islands, different languages, and still be brought together, and this is really a good example of how this you know sort of democracy uh, kekeluargaan or pancasila can be really um, reflected. So I have some now students, particularly from um, like Afghanistan or Bangladesh, and I'm really encouraging them to read how Indonesia managed to create you know, a new uh, post-colonial state, and then how Indonesia is um, really putting Indonesia together, and what actually works. What works is not just the economic formula, but I don't know, this cultural democracy, cultural inclusiveness, and I really agree that um, Indonesia has done remarkably well. And um, recently, um, just about um, 10 days ago, uh, I was um, awarded Penghargaan uh, Kebudayaan uh, Anugerah Indonesia from Ministry of Education. So, saya ucapkan terima kasih. Then I think that's really a testimony that um, they respect the scholarship. I'm not a Muslim, I'm not uh, Indonesian, but I have really I think I really uh, love Indonesia being here, and I've been teaching really um, about Indonesia in Australia. And um, I really like to, to say that um, um, Indonesia really offers a lot of in, you know, very good examples of inclusive and still religious you know, country. So um, next please. Yeah, so recently, um, one of the good things about pandemic, very few things, but uh, Amelia and I usually go a lot of places and we never sit down to write. So we are forced to sit down every day. Um, we were talking, writing together to finish this book. And this book is about how Islamic values really assist uh, women's, uh, particularly uh, gender equality. And um, uh, well, I'll talk about um, some of the things which really are uh, uh, sort of relevant to um, uh, this topic, particularly how religion matters. Religion still matters, of course. I think people here do agree religion does matter. But in the West, particularly like Australia as well, I'm surrounded by people by why do you bother? Because you know, a lot of people in Australia, 40% of young students, like my students, never go to church. And for them, religion is so what? So, so for me, teaching about Indonesia is teaching about how religion functions and how religion is integrated and also the basis of inclusiveness. And that's what I've been teaching at the UNSW Canberra. Um, so in this book, I'd like to just uh, sort of um, pick a few things. Uh, next slide, please. Which are important uh, to, to think about how religion matters, particularly in the economy. So Bob didn't talk about particularly economy, but I think he has published particularly about um, Sharia Bank as well and market. So I'm kind of um, reflecting his interest and uh, my interest 
in that area. And um, so theoretical implication of then if religion matters, what does it mean? And it's so obvious, I think a few keynote speakers have mentioned that modernity is not secular. So I think, but still, modernity is not secular, but human rights, democracy, social justice can be um, achieved by using inclusive, um, creative interpretation of um, Islam. And um, that is definitely emerging in Indonesia, so I'll give some examples. And then I will summarize findings and policy implications. So uh, very um, briefly, because it's not a lecture clear umum, so I just skip quite a lot of details. But where it fits, you know, so a lot of um, theoretical discussions about um, women's development is um, really women have been sort of thought more like uh, placed as a tool for development. That was in the 70s. And then in the 80s, uh, I think, um, you know, I joked, Tawang was here, but First time I came to Indonesia was 84. And I can really see the huge uh, development sort of progress in Indonesia now. And um, but during that time, I think what, what I can see is Kabe, you know, Kuraruga Brenjana, and um, other mothers. And then women uh, have been treated as a, a device or person who would actually implement um, sort of um, national uh, planning. But that really just sort of ignored or undermined women's own thinking. And um, I think in the 90s onwards, uh, particularly the word gender empowerment, you know, gender equality, the relationship between men and women and other sexualities uh, uh, started to emerge. And uh, now Millennium Development Goals, after that Sustainable Development Goals, these really uh, matters are talking about gender equality is important. And what's really um, important is in Indonesia, I think with this really, uh, I compared, I originally come from Japan, but uh, gender equality in Japan is still at the bottom. Um, really, Indonesia is much higher. So maybe that explains why I have really become fascinated with you know, Indonesian uh, culture and society and women, and I really feel uh, Indonesia is showing you know, a lot of um, uh, new thinking and the innovations, and um, as a scholar, I think um, my job is to unpack that. So, next please. Yeah. so what, how it is relevant is, um, uh, particularly gender and development, this GAD um, approach, um, we really like to focus on how women feel about their role. Um, if they have a job, if they have uh, earning a good income, are they feeling happy or not? If sort of women themselves are not feeling they are making their own choice at their own will, it is not empowerment. So what I really think, you know, and uh, with Amel, uh, what we have done is um, how gender issues uh, can be placed in a specific social, economic, historical context. So sometimes I don't dress this way in Canberra, but um, today I'm kind of adjusting in a sense, but I think I really uh, like this Minan show, you know, Slendan, and um, I'm very proud to use it. But often, I think, in the Western countries, um, a lot of perception is, well, uh, you know, women are wearing hijab, you know, and then they're forced. But I don't think so. You know, I have had so many discussions, and then they're part of you know, their clothing, they're part of their identity, and it's important, and it is, should be beautiful. So. In that way, I think you know, asking women to take off their hijab, you know, is really forced way of sort of you have a choice. Then if I have a choice, I'm here in Indonesia. I love this slendang, and um, this is Hasil Iset, you know, UKM. So I bought you know this one, and um, I'm really showing off. And I think I'm going to put it onto Instagram today to show that it's really Minan. And um, um, Kabal people has got really beautiful, you know, art crafts and Kurajinan tangan. So. I think in that context, what I really like to emphasize is really focus on uh, women's own perceptions and um, critically um, examine what secularization means. So if someone doesn't want to follow religion, yes, you can. But if someone wants to, why do we have to? So that's where theoretically I stand. Uh, next, please. 
Um, so in this book, I think uh, what probably um, what I'd like to focus on, uh, emphasize um, specifically is negotiation of patriarchy and in fact, you know, sort of like uh, uh, whatever, Wally, you know, anyone who is getting married, you need a guardian to endorse your marriage and you have to have you know, a nigga, you know, you have to have a Wally. So in that way, it's true that um, this particular patriarchy does exist in Indonesia, Muslim countries. But Muslim women are negotiating, uh, particularly the way um, their role can be uh, much more sort of um, extended. And uh, two role modelings we have identified is Hadija, the first wife of um, uh, Prophet, and who was a successful entrepreneur, and then who really made a fortune, and then she also assisted you know, um, her husband um, spread Islam with her wealth. So she also is a mother. She was a mother of her uh, children with the prophet. So in that sense, she has made a really great contribution as a mother and a wife, and then she also had a career. So this is really, you know, suit to everyone's um, sort of ideal type, as well as Aisha, um, who is also known to be pious and who really knows a lot about what the prophet did, you know, hadith. So in that way, I think these two, it's very religiously minded and loving wife and you know, mother, and um, who can be useful for the community. I think what else are we looking for, whether that's religious or not religious, I'm very proud if someone is, you know, have got successful career, successful and religiously, you know, committed, and then trying to build the society together with religious motives, and um, also mother and a wife, you know, so that's really um, what is, I think, you know, um, Muslim women are using to um, create their own sort of um, identity and then to pr advance their gender equality. And um, who would really criticize someone who wants to become one of the best examples as a woman in Muslim histories? So this is really working and I think it's, well, I like to say that um, there are some reasons which, um, on the sort of factors which really support um, how this particular interpretation is available. But um, um, particularly upper middle class women, particularly here, who are university professors, they've got resources to delegate some of the um, domestic chores to someone else. So I'm not saying that that's the best way, but at least they are also showing that women can do uh, with some assistance. And also, as um, Pat Bob said, you know, interpretations of Islam, uh, Muslims uh, really uh, organizations accepted a very inclusive way of interpretations of Islam. Therefore, there are a lot of very fluid and um, creative interpretations of um, law models um, supported by uh, Muslim organizations uh, as well. And also educated women, um, but Bob also mentioned about the role of higher education. So um, really, Islam is thriving and the halal economy is, is growing, then why not? You know, we can become a fashionista like uh, you know, hijabers and then we can also enjoy our, what we love and we like to be what, who we want to be. And we like to have a um, husband, we like to have children and career and then contribute to society. And then, in fact, then gender equality, um, sustainable development goals number five can be achieved, including um, Islamic ideas. Thank you. Uh, next page. Yeah, so um, Indonesia definitely has this concept of economic rayakatan, sort of um, people's economy. So um, UKM or s small and medium enterprises have been supported. And in fact, um, as Bob, uh, Bob said, you know, Aisha uh, or Muslimat, um, these um, organizations associate with Muhammadiyah or Nafratul Ulama are uh, very much full on. Uh, last week I went to Bukit Tinggi and then I visited um, sort of um, Skora Wirausaha Prempuan uh, under Aisha. And they are um, s supporting um, short courses to um, train women. But at the same time, they are also you know, um, making sure that they are going to become a good uh, Muslim women. So after the training, they said, you know, Solat dulu, barukulan, you know. So 
that, that's, that's really a combined way and um, um, other associations are also emerging and um, well, national programs and um, earning an income, you know, also then uh, increasing women's public role. That's all supported by, you know, Muslim women's organizations and our, uh, generally speaking, Muslim organizations. Next, please. Yeah. So there are a lot of role models um, who really, you know, we can say Ibu um, uh, Nurhayati Sabakat, owner of Wabda, I think for our book, we uh, were fortunate to be able to see her a few times. And she's from Bukit Tinggi, from West Matra, and then she is a wife, and she's a mother, and then she is a successful owner. Um, herself doesn't say that I'm a role model for everyone. She's very, very um, sort of humble and nice, you know, um, community sort of very um, humble lady, and but she really offers a lot. So in um, Padan, where I was last week, um, lots of um, projects have been also um, supported by her um, company's um, uh, CSR. And how I think Islam is really accommodating and you know this kind of um, supportive role is um, particularly Pungajian, you know, Islamic study group, where um, people, women get together to study Islam but at the same time, they actually talk about how that particular concept of Islam can be uh, linked with, you know, business training. So, and then also, kalau ada pengajian, pasti ada arisan dan makan-makan. So it's a good way to really create sisterhood. So what I said is um, this um, pengajian, in this Islamic study group, and then also in order to keep this study group. Uh, this is a financial, you know, rotating financial, fin rotating month, rotating credit system, where uh, the receiver will actually use the um, um, money to cater for um, sort of food, but at the same time, particular money can be used to start, you know, start up. So I have seen quite a lot of successful Pungajian and um, Arisan, uh, which really offer. Um, training and um, um, social capital building network system and skalian promosi you know barambaran. So at the same time, people who have success ini buatan saya mau dijual. So that sort of um, uh, activities are going on. So Islam is not separate. Just uh, once a week you'd go to a particular place to pray. No, it's part of your fashion statement as well as identity, as well as um, sort of studying about the religion. And then you can also buy um, uh, each other's product. And then also you can also invite, you know, sort of um, specialists to train, you know, um, business tips. So I have been invited to uh, quite a lot of successful Pungajian, Skarian Arisan, then uh, Skarian, you know, sort of Pasar, Bazar. So this really shows how Islam is really part of the um, everyday life and particularly economic activities in Indonesia, uh, which is really now um, progressing very well. But what I'm kind of a bit concerned about is the digital divide, uh, which is happening in Indonesia. So people who have got a gadget device, who can use Instagram, they are really uh, progressing. But there are people who are not. So that's the next um, slide, which probably uh, we'll talk about. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so before I just go into this, um, I also followed some of the successful um, Muslim ladies, um, Ibu Diyan Pelangi. Um, bef uh, first time when she was married, I think she, she was very much focused on her uh, entrepreneurship, you know, fashion designer work. And then she really posted something very uh, Western women can perhaps you know, relate to, which is if you have got your own income, you like to pay for your own bills. So you're not relying on man. It's my money, it's my work, it's my life. So which I think I would definitely can relate to. And a lot of Western women would like to see Muslim women saying this. But I think she was kind of um, uh, received critical comments online. And after the, her first marriage, next slide please. Um, next slide. 
And so then I think when she got married, um, she immediately fell pregnant and she was really happy and she received a lot of you know, likes. And she actually showed um, really, you know, now I'm, I'm my you know, pregnancy kit showed positive. I actually watched a real you know, uh, video as well and she looked happy and then I think that I just scrolled her photo Instagram um, yesterday as well. So now she's got a very pretty daughter and um, she's also designing you know, the kids' um, uh, clothes line as well. And now her identity has changed. She is now wife, mother, and entrepreneur. So before that, she was actually having identity as entrepreneur. So in Indonesia, um, she is now, uh, I think, definitely happy with her multiple roles. And um, we also, in chapter four in our book, we studied about single career women's um, predicaments in Indonesia. So a lot of women who are single and who are career oriented, um, they are not really happy. And I think we also explored um, single women, you know, Prawantua, uh, in England um, as well. And um, that uh, particular uh, story was um, people who cannot find a suitable husband uh, even trying to become, you know, Madhu, you know, so a second wife. And uh, there's actually an application to find a sort of um, second wife, you know, um, search engine as well. So what it, it really shows is just pursuing career uh, um, success um, based on feminism, it should really bring happiness. But in Western, uh, in Islamic context, I think um, what we are can safely say is um, as a woman, um, a lot of people feel wife, and mother, um, very important aspect. And then I myself, I think I got married pretty late. So when I had a husband and a kid, I actually, in Indonesia, people say, Alhamdulillah, you know, that, that's the word I received. But uh, now I really am feeling happy because my son's around 20 years old and um, it's really good to dis have discussions with him. So next, I'm closing very soon, yeah. And so, I think what I really like to focus is Islam, how Islam matters. So, you know, Kiai Ulil mentioned how it matters. So I've just given you examples of how it matters. So Islam is not just for praying. It's really, you know, linked with clothing. It, clothes, uh, it is uh, also Pungajian training, as well as branding and the network. And a lot of people can have a kind of Churhat session in you know, Pungajian as well. So it's a sister who would mentoring. So if you go to a business school, all these things are taught, but without any kind of reference to religion. But in Indonesia, it's really combined. Okay. The next, please. Yeah. And so I'm just giving you some examples which we, we talked about. And so this um, from Bogol, um, she's running a halal bakery. So um, she used to be a um, uh, docent in IPB, but um, she changed her occupation to become an entrepreneur to manage um, motherhood as well as wife and then also her contribution. So what um, she is saying, I think her story is saying is this particular way of negotiating you know, um, their role as Hadija and Aisha, that is really um, giving women a new way of participating and also getting a lot of sort of social recognition in the public. Next, please. Yeah. So I think, so to conclude, you know, this um, religion definitely matters. And um, local strategy, which Indonesia is showing, is how Islam can assist women. So I really don't want Afghanistan to be the face of Islam, you know, uh, particularly for gender equality. Women cannot go to, you know, even school. Women cannot do anything. No, in Indonesia. Women are really trying to, to uh, um, sort of have, have negotiated and they are really having important positions, particularly in universities. So I think that's really important. And um, um, uh, also women gaining social status also give credit to men. So, you know, I think often the joke is, you know, istri sunan, you know, suami sunan. But I think to be right? I think um, uh, istri sunan jadi suaminya sunan juga. I think that that's my take. And um, next slide, please. And so I think just what we'd like to, to offer as a conclusion is 
this challenge. A lot of women are now going into business, particularly e-business. So um, e-market and then um, digital market are offering a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, what we are seeing is these kind of small scale entrepreneurship uh, seems to be thriving, but they are informal. So in, in fact, women are earning, but they, they, their business is not really registered, not structured. So in that way, I think it's a problem because in terms of statistics, women's um, participation in the economy doesn't seem to pick up if women are not registered in their businesses. And this invisibility of women would really make up um, a big problem because no activities, then no social policy support. So I think what's important is how Muslim organizations can support you know, women to formalize their businesses. That's really important. And also what's important is uh, some people who cannot really have digital presence, they seem to be losing business opportunities. So um, that's another way I think, you know, how Muslim organizations can assist women who do not have digital presence or who do not have the needs, who do not have the kind of um, aspiration to do so, what kind of jobs can they do if um, in the future uh, everything or the transactions will really turning into digital space? Uh, next, please. Yeah. So I think it, that's probably what we can really say about um, um, my uh, findings. And I like to, you know, thank Amelia, you know, to really go with all the details together when we published. And this afternoon, we like to really explore more about um, so this digital um, implication for women. So if anyone is interested, we'd like to invite you to back to our panel session um, at 1.30 um, today about a um, special panel on implication of smart cities for community resilience. And we're talking about not only just the IKN, but um, sort of how then Indonesia, which ha really has been inclusive, and how Indonesia can overcome the challenges coming from this uh, spread of e-commerce, digital economy, which can be very exclusive because um, I happen to, to upgrade my phone to iPhone 14, 15, but um, I think uh, before then was um, iPhone 6. And then I went to Singapore and uh, immigration couldn't actually let me through because my phone was too old to talk to the application. So then I had to, to change. but. That really gives, gave me a kind of um, sort of fear that if you are not compatible with particular mode of operation, you are not a citizen or you are not really legal. You know? So that really is a problem and I think Indonesia is now showing a lot of advancement of um, businesses, particularly using um, um, e-format, but um, how we can then um, do this as you know, because the format itself is becoming very much exclusive. So that's my kind of um, take for, um, for this afternoon as well. And um, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Give applause to Prof. Sakai. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Prof. Sakai is Indonesia from uh, economic and social life, social aspect. Um, uh, social and economy uh, aspect in Indonesia is really reflected by uh, religion. Uh, so again, religion still matter in Indonesia. Um, but unfortunately, there are many works have to be done in Indonesia because uh, the ultimate values of Islam, uh, especially because Islam is uh, the majority religion in Indonesia, uh, still not working or still not um, performing in the grassroots. Uh, if I may uh, share my story when I was in Turkey, um, especially in Kurban Day, so Muslim um, sacrifice uh, uh, animal. And when I share the story of my village, uh, in my village, one month before uh, Bayram, uh, Kurban Bayram, uh, they say Kurban Bayram for uh, Hari Raya, um, uh, the Imam will pronounce to people who want to sacrifice and they collect the name and after that they make a list. But in Turkey, they don't do the same thing. 
in Turkey they do sacrifice in every house uh, in every house so there are many God uh, not uh, s uh, share uh, spread to people because everyone is uh, doing sacrificing so <laughs> So this is the best value actually we can learn uh, they get from Indonesia. Thank you very much uh, once again from Sakai and for the last speaker we have today um, Professor Dr. Abbas Panakal from University of St. Andrews United Kingdom. The time is yours. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum to all. Um, let's uh, start this slide I think. We'll go with the subject. Okay, so I will talk something, you know, the subject uh, suggested by our organizers and uh, really thank to all, especially Yuli and also Professor Fauzia and Rector and also Nelson Luluma team and our co-organizers, you know, bringing this wonderful event and especially discussing the technology, you know, that affects especially religion, democracy, and peace building. People were in the field of uh, peace building for years, maybe decades, but, you know, suddenly things are changing because of involvement of technology. So, I'm happy that yesterday when I came here, uh, Yuli was wearing the Palestinian flag dress code. So, I found there was a big protest. It was the biggest in the world, largest protest organized in the world to keep peace in the region. Then in the morning, when I look into the newspapers, can we have the second one slide? I found this is a newspaper from United Arab Emirates this morning. Uh, now I think it's uh, 9 o'clock there. I found this in the morning, early morning, maybe there 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning in the United States. Arab Emirates, they published the first picture from Indonesia. Yesterday, the big protest picture is carried over the world, all newspaper in the world. So you can see how important is, is this. This is the newspaper today published in Middle East. They carried the biggest one. So, uh, no, just I thought, you know, I'll start with this because everywhere people are talking about peace building. So Indonesia was doing the best yesterday for that course and and also when I think of your vernacular I found that even the word that we use salamat pagi you know that itself come with a peace you know so I found in Indonesia the life of the people it's related and your language and maybe your culture you know it has some inclined attachment with the peace okay let's go to the subject next I will just tell uh, this is the introduction because I think we have uh, how 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah, I will sum up in 15 minutes. So this is the introduction, you know, history of peace building during turmoil. Because now world is in turmoil. I'm coming from, originally from Malabar, South India. The word always uh, jihad, you know, the word jihad always controversial. Especially in Western context, jihad is a terrible word, but it was introduced in my area, in my local language, as a word of harmony. In 16th century, when Portuguese came, you know, Portuguese came first there and then they attacked this region. So the Vasco da Gama first landed in the south region was in my village. Yeah, in 1498, you know that, the time they came over there and they claimed, you know, there was a climb at that time. He is the first one who came from Europe to uh, Indian subcontinent or the South and Southeast Asia or Asian region. But it was a false claim. You know, historically, it was a uh, his historiography written by the conquerors. They were telling that, because we have history before that, uh, you know, Periplus of Eritrean Sea that talk about the Greeks were coming over there, they were doing business with our region. And now we have excavation, Government of India has spent a lot of money to dig the oldest cities that mentioned in old document of Greeks. And we found Greek coins over there, that's in BC and first century of AD, 
we had wonderful trade relation then that trade relation continued because the egypt was part of greek and egyptians were coming that way through arabs and arab trading was there that time the trade was linked through this area to um, china and we have great travelers ibn batuta came before him and even zheng ho from uh, china he came through this region and he went till africa so those trade routes were there but still we were taught in earlier time he is the first european he came and touched thus one atrocity we have gone through the history uh, historiography done by conquerors so no just i was telling that uh, how history and i will mention one more thing you know because we have some up when jihad was introduced i told you that there is a line there is a book written by it's a poetry written in 16th century is the poet name is kazi muhammad he wrote a poetry he is telling that uh, the regional people they conquered the fort built by portuguese it's a calicut fort chaliam fort in 1573 so muslim were fighting there were muslim fighters they were navy navy full navy of hindu king it was not a democracy at the time the kings were ruling the region so the king's army uh, naval force or naval force was all muslims because hindus believe that they cannot go to the sea because it was bad of men according to their religion so muslims were full army and this hindu king were encouraging hindus to convert at least one person in the family to islam you know to strengthen the army there muslim sorry muslim naval force over there so muslim naval force was fighting against uh, portuguese at that time hindus told that no no we don't allow muslims to fight alone and die we don't allow you to do jihad and die alone because you are minority in the country we will fight in front and will die first then only we will allow you to die that is the first jihad and this was the harmonious jihad this was the jihad of uh, coexistence we learned first in our document this document that called fathul mubin it's available in british library document in british library it's a, a manuscripts it's still preserved over there so this is just a history of peace you know because it was different in the earlier time okay so there is a disruptive technology you know now we are using lot of technologies i will quickly go because i don't want to take more time on that the challenges because at the covid time we used to more technologies different religion you can see that hindus used and muslims and we were learning the two years some, some sometimes we cannot go to the mosque or we were not into the real practices they were doing lot long time and some people had some kind of maybe mental pressure because of that but now we use to accept technologies and we are ready to uh, incline with those things so vir virtual worship and religious gatherings were everywhere today the new new people are more linear to that let's go next one so it has some ethical and uh, moral concern you know because new ai things are coming the theological debate on ai and transhumanism there the religion speaks the religion matters you know religion because religious ethics that never go beyond any kind of available technology because we have all the foods but some religious people cannot take it we will tell that it will be uh, giving some pleasure or some kind of uh, maybe i don't know they will be enthusiastic to take other people you know because of their religion they will tell no to that so same kind of things will be in case of ai and transhumanism people talking about but a religious person can tell no you know because he has proved that earlier even the dress code even in using maybe gold you know men cannot use because he may be a wealthier millionaire billionaire he say no to something because he is a believer so in the case of ai religious people can have some kind of uh, no you know in some some areas so i think the religion will be a matter real matter in ethical and moral concern of new technologies so the, there are theological debates but i believe that the real believer can have boundaries okay 
so the case studies are coming you know because all religious perspective because religious leaders are telling because earlier time when uh, some invention came you know when television came and also when uh, cinema came our religious leaders were telling haram you know but when ai came or face facebook instagram lot of things came nobody i think were telling but somebody tell something but they post in facebook and tell because there later on you know i found a debate in the tv somebody coming into tv and sometimes they talk about uh, some bad effects of the television on that so that's good you know but they are not fully against those kind of things so all the religious groups muslims christian jews all other groups they are using this and there are lot of studies on that let's go next next slide so that's what is on religion i'm talking because i think this uh, very vast subject they put it there is also a case of democracy i i will mention that just because i am from a country uh, i born in a country that is concerned the largest democracy in the world india what is happening because uh, usa is talking about democracy now because united nation i have got chance many times to go there maybe speak in different occasions over there in so what we found that when there is a issue in the world they are we all talk about democracy but some country can veto it veto there you know because in palestine issue we found the veto power of america there over so it has to be reoriented i think the current democracy or even from a democratic country i will tell you how the new technology affect us so let's go next because you know uh, nowadays we have a political polarization and we also talk about uh, algorithms you know you know algorithm now newly introduced in the facebook and instagram because what we post and what is our what is we write or what is our interest you know it will uh, read by the people who are interested in the same things that you can see that those blue people they are connected in between this is the algorithm now work you know so what we read will be favor to us what we read or what we understand from the social media will be uh, inclined or it will be in favor of our research or our postings this kind of algorithm is everywhere okay let's go next then the electoral process comes you know because in last uh, trumps times you know they told that there was influence uh, his election was influenced from there was allegations because another power russia was influencing them there was same like in india now we vote using the electronic voting machine so opposition parties are tell accusing that this can be manipulated you know because we vote we know because then machine you know machine tell how many vote went to this one and that one you know and we we have vv pat system but it's not fully so vv pat what we do we print the vote and keep it there randomly we print and keep it there just some 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 people have some kind of issues and allegation it can be recounted but it won't be done 100% you know maybe 10% of vv pat will be kept to just a random check so in this case modern technological system we have these issues then what happens you know then another issue is that emerge challenges in democracy and it's not in democracy in its all other areas it's we are calling deep fake so i think religion can also be a still matter there because fake you know we don't go for fake we know that we are believing the realities and also re on religious person cannot do that or religious person is a good believer he cannot do that the deep fakes and also this kind of uh, manipulation you know so i believe that uh, especially we saw the deep fake videos because these are some of the things that we can make people will feel that so i believe that the belief and religion that really the matters in this time and also we call because we were different eras you know modernism postmodernism now 
post truth era i think one religious person even cannot be a post truth person the religion is based on truth how religion go to the post truth so there is a, there are such kind of debates you know same like in post truth if there are people in post truth they can talk about deep fake because if they are about the fake because there there were a lot of fakes earlier they were accepting the fake now fake the word is not enough because the terminology is not enough the, now they use deep fake even fake itself is a matter for religion they don't use the fake so those who were using the fake for long time now they need new terminology so they use deep fake same like that the the post truth you know <laughs> i don't know how the terminology that never can match with the religion any religion i think so let's go next this, yeah this also really impact the peace building because uh, i am in a group uh, based based the peace builders from around the world uli is part of that i think a lot of indonesians and people from around the world because it's based in portugal on international dialogue center we have a group more than 500 people from different religious background that uh, whatsapp group stopped for one week because of the middle east event because a lot of people coming with a different opinion on that that disturbed the peace among the colleagues we know each other we know he is a rabbi and he is a imam and uh, i am a academic in the peace building but people are coming with the different opinions and they support different groups because of some big reasons and they stopped it they told that don't post anything the whatsapp group it became admin only that they, they ask people to be calm and quiet at home you know so how the social media really impact the peace building even even the peace builders they are peace builders they are tot people tot mean trainers of trainers they are very prominent i know these are the number one people who are in the group maybe the prominent people from Indo indonesia a lot of deans and a lot of very prominent peace builders but the social media was affecting them very harshly and this international group told them don't post anything be calm and quiet don't come involved in these kind of issues so because of that you know we can see you now how it's he'll build the how it's the impact the peace building so it is the case of the peace builders especially who are working in the field maybe for last one decade 10 years or more than that the life long time they were spending on peace building their mind was disrupted and they were talking or defending their own beliefs at the time so i believe that it will be more uh, creating more chaos in the mind of normal people who were not in the peace building who were not learned about or trained about the reconciliations so we can understand what is happening in the other part let's go then yeah this is the uh, social media conflicts are there this is i just i was mentioning in middle east conflicts is every war in the world it's affected the people sometimes i only i told yesterday i only watch maybe half an hour social media because everything about the conflicts that really affect our mental structure and maybe our studies and readings because every war we see that uh, death of the small kids and babies and crying of mothers really this affect us very much and also there is a you know that Uh, my I, will, i will i think i have a few one or two slides i'll tell you how these uh, social medias work you know these social media they have their own algorithms and they ha they, are, they have their own investors the most of the influential social medias you know they media they do they hide some of the posts they take out you, lot of people have this kind of uh, experience nowadays you know they are not showing up the post everything is there these kind of things are because it's earlier we call linguistic war warfare there are different kind of wars you know linguistic warfare means they use different words because of the linguistic war the jihad became a bad word because it was a struggle in islam or in the religion it was not used for the bad things earlier and khilafa and khalifa and islamic state all became 
very bad terminologies because of linguistic warfare. Now it's coming the warfare of social media. Social media is doing a lot in this time of war. That will be studied later, I think. Let's go next. So, yeah, privacy, data security. So we all talk about privacy and data security. I've been three or four times to Cupertino. My friends, my relatives and my neighbors and colleagues who are working in different platforms. I have friends in Apple. I have friends in uh, Google and also Instagram and Facebook. I went also the top of the Facebook. There is a garden and whenever I go, I visit them. I asked my friend in Google, uh, what is your job over there? How do you get money? Because we are not paying. We all use Google uh, email. We all search in the Google. Maybe three, four times you search today. You got a lot of information. Did you pay for them? No. Oh, five? Okay. Finish? Okay. Uh, so, uh, my friend, he told me that they sell the data. Because if somebody in uh, Jakarta want to start a business of the dress, dress, the Google will provide them. He can approach the Google. They will tell that how many people are looking for suit or looking for a buyer here in this area. So all these things will be put into one folder. There are, nobody is analyzing this. They have softwares. The software will, so what is his job is that taking from that software has already sorted out all that information. They will give the information to different companies and they will get money out of that. This is one case. And, the, and another case, you know, they know what you do and even your screen, screen, you know, if you open the screen and talk something, that detects and it also recorded, you know, everywhere. So data is everywhere and uh, this is sold by these kind of big companies. They will talk about this, you know, privacy, data security and concern. <laughs> so bias of algorithm and decision making and they help to make decision others through us, we get a lot of frees and uh, <laughs> so we enjoy the free of the things. Who is the best, bis the, maybe uh, the largest business people in the world now, those who run these kind of things, because who is working for us? And this morning I was working for Google, I was working for Facebook, I was working for LinkedIn and Instagram. We all work for them. Every day maybe we look our, how long we use our screen, seven hours, more than our work time we use for these kind of things. So there are also religion matters. How do we deal? According to our belief and the things that can be viewed or that can be analyzed or can be sold to other world. Let's go because time is up. Uh, ethical social implication, the privacy. Sorry, let's next, 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 next. Yeah, this is a conclusion. I'm summing up here. What is the conclusion is a call for action, responsible technology adoption in discussed domains, the responsible adoption of technology in all domains. Who can be responsible nowadays? The ethical things. I believe that all the religion have the ethics. So religion is the matter in the time of technology. That's the word, the final word I have to give you. Thank you so much for listening. Terima <laughs> kasih. Thank you, Bro Abbas for uh, the insights. I imagine uh, our world today is uh, like um, we are controlled by invisible hand, by algorithm. And it's so scary actually, because um, who create this algorithm, maybe they cannot control <laughs> anymore this program. And the algorithm control back uh, our consciousness. So scary. Actually, uh, the uh, discussion today is really interesting, but um, we need to uh, take a break yeah, for lunch because <laughs> we need some logistic to continue uh, the session in this uh, conference. Thank you very much for your attention uh, because uh, in the beginning I didn't say uh, I didn't say salam to you all, so I will end up this uh, session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and back to Kamitu. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, 
let us thank you to our three panelists. The first is Professor Robert W. Hefner, PhD from Boston University. The second is Professor Minako Sakai, PhD from UNSW. The third is Dr. Abbas Banakal from University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom. And also, uh, thanks to our great moderator, Ibu Siti Aisha, SEM Phil, for leading the plenary session one. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to give our warm appreciation to all collaborators of the sixth iconist. We would like to invite the representatives of University of New South Wales, represented by Professor Minako Sakai, PhD, PBNU Central Board of Nadlatul Ulama, represented by K. Haji Ulil Absar Abdullah, MA, from University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom, Dr. Abbas Panakal, De La Salle University, Fernando A. Santiago, from St. Andrews University, Professor Dr. Nasser Muhammad Arif, and also from Bank BJB. All the respected representatives may have your place in front of the stage. And I would like to ask the willingness from uh, Mr. Dean Wahid, PhD, as the Deputy Counselor for Cooperation and Institutions, Professor Amelia Fauzia, MA, PhD, and also Mr. Fatudin, MA, whom MH, the Secretary of LPPM Institute, to deliver the placard to our collaborators. Bapak Ibu diharap untuk mengharap ke banner yang ada di depan panggung karena kameramennya akan mengambil gambar dari atas panggung. Dan kepada peserta sekalian diharap kesediaannya untuk berdiri untuk sesi foto bersama. Kepada Panitia The Six Iconist, mohon kesediaannya untuk bergabung ke depan panggung untuk sesi foto bersama.
one more time, we would like to ask everybody to please face the banner in front of the stage and we'll have a photo session together. Okay, kameramen yang sudah siap, ya. Bapak Ibu sekalian, pada hitungan ketiga ya. Satu, dua, tiga. Baik. One more time on count of three. One, two, three. Satu kali lagi. Satu. applause for all the guests of the 6th Iconist 2023. Gentlemen, please enjoy your lunch break. Thank you so much. What? What? Okay. Baik Bapak Ibu sekalian, setelah ini akan dilanjutkan dengan lunch break sampai pukul 1.30 dan selanjutnya akan ada parallel session secara virtual. Uh, untuk informasi lebih lanjut, lunch break uh, tersedia di lantai satu. Thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Nantikan Shopee 11 Big Sale Midnight Sale 11 November dari jam 12 malam hingga 2 pagi. Promo terbesar tahun ini. Dapatkan beragam promo menarik di Shopee Live. 11 November, 11 November, 11 November.